Now, can I welcome Professor Matthew Flinders and Katie Ghosh, Chief Executive of the Electoral Reform Society. And uh, I know that each of you have been taking a leading role in setting up the pilots for citizens' assemblies. Um, perhaps I could begin the questioning by asking you what you see as the product of these pilots. What did they demonstrate or uh, what did they show can be done? Okay. Um, well, I think what's, what's probably for me the best or the suggested main output of the assemblies is that uh, we live in a time that's dominated by a lot of cynicism about politics and about the public's interest in politics. And for me, as a political scientist, what's been most amazing about these pilot assemblies, Assembly North in Sheffield and Assembly South in Southampton, is actually the huge public appetite to learn about what's going on and to get engaged and give up their time to learn to deliberate and to come to a view on things in a way that really goes against a lot of the academic literature. However, the public want to have informed debate. They don't want to feel they're involved in tokenist, tokenistic window dressing. They want to feel that there's a link between what they're contributing to and the policy-making world. But give them that link, and there's a desire for fresh ways of doing politics. Shall I just build on that um, a little bit? I'd, I'd absolutely echo the kind of uh, the real sort of ability and willingness we saw among citizens, many of whom aren't in the usual business of being engaged with formal political debate, to really grapple with quite complex issues of governance. So that was really, really encouraging. There was an incredibly high retention rate between the two weekends. So the people who came along then absolutely sort of um, got hold of the issues and, and said this is really, things like this has really kind of blown me away and I, I, want, I want more sort of knowledge and learning. And I think the other thing that we did that was important and took away from it is the difference between doing a sort of a deliberative exercise, if you like, that's, that's spread out into phases. So there's a learning phase where people get up to speed on the status quo and how local government or national government works. Then there's a kind of consultation phase where they can take on views of the wider public. And then there's a deliberation phase where they kind of challenge each other's views and, and, and so on. So I think those, those phases worked. And I think the lesson I took is we were doing this in miniature, if you like, but I think a lot of what we did could be scaled up and done on a kind of UK-wide basis in, in, a, in a constitutional convention. I was going to ask you about that, because obviously the pilots were comparatively small groups, and they were perhaps um, quite strongly stage-managed and, and handled and so on, in order to get the best out of, the, uh, of those who took the members of the groups. So you think this can be replicated over a larger scale? Yes. Very much so. Um, I think a lot of the lessons we learn how to get a reasonably representative sample of the population, uh, the importance of having quite a focused agenda and a topic that can be dealt with in the time available, but also having a little bit of open space for people to, to, to discuss or deliberate other topics as well. I think there's definitely some lessons there that could be scaled up. I well, noticed that the, the pilots, for example, the members of the groups were, so to speak, hand-picked is that the right word? And also that a lot of care was taken to make sure that the uh, personal um, experience was, was tailored to the occasion, as it were. They weren't put, put under too much pressure. They were given some time to think and so on. Um, is that possible? Can one deal that on a larger scale? Can I come, come back on that? Um, the, the participants in the assemblies, they were not hand-picked. We commissioned YouGov to... Um, approach and recruit members for the assemblies. Um, we had a fairly good cross-representation of society and in fact one of the interesting things about the pilots was it uncovered areas where if you were to scale up how you might have to have random sampling that you then came back to with more targeted recruitment to make up for specific areas of society that hadn't come through the random sampling. But there was certainly no hand-picking, and lots of people that were involved hadn't had any involvement with politics ever before. The, the issue with um, stage management and, and support is absolutely key, and there's no doubt it would be possible to organise a citizens' assembly and design the assembly and ensure the facilitators work the assembly in a different direction, and even invited witnesses who would give a certain view on an issue. One of the things, um, we had an advisory board from all over the world of directors of large 
national and regional citizens' assemblies. And one of the things we spent a lot of time on was at the beginning of the assembly allowing the members to decide the principles and values the rules of the game for their own assembly and what they wanted to look at. So one of the challenges as uh, an investigator was we had to be responsive by the hour to what the assembly said they wanted us to deliver for them and change and be very flexible around them. Um, it was a, a very interesting and positive experiment. Follow up in terms of the, the selection, and you've mentioned that to a certain extent. Um, but you know, by definition, people who come to an event like that uh, have either a confidence or an ability or an interest you know, that you're reinforcing or tapping into. Uh, so, could you just remind us of the, of the actual numbers and the time scale of what you were doing and how much uh, involvement there was there? But also, did you do anything to find out whether? having brought people into this Citizens' Assembly, they then became interested in more mainstream politics or went to, as visitors at council meetings or got involved in any other way and sustained that interest? Um, that's a, a, a really fantastic question. And one of the uh, challenges of the organisers was that um, the assemblies lasted over uh, basically an eight-week process with two residential weekends within that eight weeks. And the members of the assemblies tended to work together as a community online between the actual weekends. And a huge number started going off and meeting their MPs, meeting councillors, organising community events on their own. There was a real sort of dynamism that took off. The initial recruitment of members, we worked with YouGov. They had um, a large sample database in our two regions of the country of several thousand people. Um, uh, a, a random process was used to invite cross-sections to express an interest. If members of the, you're absolutely right about the self-selection issue, that these were people that had already, in effect, uh, joined the YouGov panels, and that is a key issue. There's no hiding that at all. But then we went through and made sure that all of the people that had expressed an interest from a range of different backgrounds, we spoke to them on the phone, we explained exactly what was needed. The, the support for members of the assemblies is absolutely critical because we had lots of people turning up who knew nothing about politics from all over South Yorkshire and uh, they were really scared. They were really nervous about what they were doing. So we had more facilitators and staff at the assembly using brilliant volunteer students who had had their own specialist training. But that support for people to allow them to be confident and speak openly throughout the process w was key. So a lot of personal care it's, it's a resource-intensive process having a citizens' assembly, but not necessarily in terms of money. Now, um, we do have a specific short note from YouGov on some of the challenges of recruiting a large cross-section of society, which I'm happy to send to the committee after today's meeting. More broadly, amongst politics, there's a big, a rising level of democratic inequality, particularly amongst the economically disadvantaged and the young. And what became clear, and this was the great reason for having a pilot, was that if you were to do an assembly on a national basis, you would have to be far more proactive than maybe the polling companies would on their own be. But that's happened in other countries. That is not a challenge that would undermine the whole system, but you would have to be far more proactive in making sure that the final number of 100 people or 150 people really was representative as a whole. And once you brought the people together, making sure that they had the support in all sorts of different ways, even the tiny things are critical, um, that allowed them to forget everything outside and just commit to the process. Um, what was fantastic was our retention rates. 100% people turned up from Assembly 1, came back for Assembly 2. At the end of Assembly 2, we asked the, the members, how many of you would be willing to stay involved with the process and appear in Parliament, appear at public events to talk about your experience? 100%. We had, the initial plan was to have 45 members of the public on each of the Assembly, one in the south, one in the, the north. In the end, we ended up with around 35 people on each assembly because we had no-shows from those who weren't coming. 
The difference between the two assemblies was that the Northern Assembly was a pure assembly, just made up of members of the public. The Assembly South was a hybrid assembly, two-thirds public, one-third politicians. Um, one of the challenges there, politicians are busy people, but getting politicians to attend, commit to two full weekends was, was proved to be a big ask. But again, that's part of the learning process. The process of recruitment would presumably be intended to exclude people who had, um, let's say, uh, extreme views. Is that right? Not no, no not, not necessarily. I think well, the, the, an agenda. I think the, um, one of the values of sort of doing a deliberative exercise where you do a random representative sample, if you like, is that it actually challenges people to come along and have their views challenged. And this was something that we saw in real time, if you like. So some people came along and they had either a, a party affiliation, many people didn't, some people were involved in politics, a lot of people weren't involved in politics. What happened over the course of the, the two weekends with the three weeks in between of the online deliberation is that quite a lot of people did have their preconceptions or, or, or prior views challenged and they actually changed their mind over time. So my answer to that would be you would, what you're trying to do is to get a reasonably representative sample of the population and that must include people who've got all kinds of views within it. Our attention was drawn to a blog by Dr Alan Rennick of his experience and he said the alternative of allowing anyone to participate who wants to inevitably attracts an unrepresented proportion of political junkies many of whom with particular axes to grind. Yeah, that, that's exactly, yes, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. Right. If you, if you, if you um, don't do it in a thoughtful way and it's up to the usual suspects to, to, to trot along to something, then that's one way of doing it. The way that we were designing it and doing it was actually a real attempt to reach out and get a reasonably representative sample of the population. And that's the difference between the kind of idea of a constitutional convention writ large, if you like, <coughs> is that you really do your best... And I think it's important to say it's not just about the formal assembly members who are there. I think a good design of a constitutional convention has lots of public meetings going along on side, lots of opportunities to feed in. And the interest groups, if you like, and the politicians are really, really vital, and the technical experts, to come along and give evidence to the, the assembly members. So I think it's important to look at that sort of broader picture, if you like, of how to get as many views in as possible. I did a, a piece for the Yorkshire Post about the assemblies uh, a week or so before they were due to start and I made the mistake of putting my email on the end of the, the article and I was inundated with hundreds and hundreds of people who had very strong views and wanted to be on the assembly. How could they get on the assembly? And of course, we didn't want to fill the assembly just with those that were already politically active and interested. We, we wanted some of those, but we wanted it more broadly. But what was fascinating for me was that when we started off the assembly, it was clear there were some very extreme views and some strong characters. But as the assembly process went on, a lot of those characters became far more quiet and calm and thoughtful. And lots of the, 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 the people who hadn't had an interest in politics became more confident and started getting involved. How can a constitutional convention best be used to address questions around devolution and the territorial constitution? Could a single convention deal with the issue, or should the regions and nations of the UK each be asked to contribute? Um, I think the design should probably combine um, or be conceived of as a, a single project that stretches across the UK but that can have some conversations among citizens of each nation and then some opportunity for cross-border conversations as, as well. So what's the, the ultimate objective? Of, of a constitutional convention. Yeah, yes. I, yeah. Um, I think, and this was something I'm we... I'm trying to get, a, yeah. align this to, to your, the answers to the previous question about yes. uh, uh, <coughs> the citizens' assemblies. Yes. I mean, what's the long-term objective? Yeah. The, of, what we were really careful to do, and we've got some good learnings now from the assemblies, was to have uh, a question that could feasibly address in the time. So the question for these local pilots was essentially, where do you want power to lie in your local area? Now, for, for reasons of time and resource, that was quite a sort of limited question, if you like. We didn't particularly stray into the whole question of where power should lie between and among the nations of the UK. So that was sensible for the pilots. 
the, um, the design and the kind of ambition or objective, I think, for a constitutional convention should very much look at the territorial issues and the power and the identity issues of how are the nations of the UK going to relate to each other as well as dilly devolution within the nations. I'm not an advocate of the kind of the kitchen sink, if you like, where you organise a convention and you throw every single constitutional political reform issue. I think it's the territorial and the identity issues that should be um, the objective of that convention to really kind of unearth in, in a sensible fashion. I think for me the, 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 uh, the, the one thing to be clear of is that a constitutional convention is not going to be a panacea for the problems of the constitution that we face. There are complex challenges and there are no simple solutions. The great benefit, I think, of a constitutional convention in the current context is that there is a gap, and a very real gap, between formal politics and politicians and the broader public, and particularly sections of the public. And also, I think, the model of English devolution that is currently being uh, proposed is very different to the models of devolution that have come forward in Scotland and Wales. And there is a need to avoid the view that this is just another top-down process. There is a need for fresh ways to re-engage with the public and give them an opportunity to feed in in a meaningful way. In a sense, you might say that there's a symbolic as well as practical empirical reason for having this citizens' assembly. Well, that's sy symbolic view that the political world is listening, it can do things differently, is itself very important. The $100 million question, though, to think about is the reconnection point or the nexus. So you have a big constitutional convention, it's very successful, it gets a lot of public and media attention, it creates a groundswell of democratic energy, but then what? In some countries, politicians have been brave and have said, whatever the Citizens' Assembly comes up with, its recommendations will be put directly to the public. In other countries, the recommendations have been purely advisory and have been left on the shelf. There's a great danger around constitutional innovation that there's nothing worse than rising the, raising the public's expectations and then dashing them because you make things seem worse than they were already. So there's a real need to think about if there was a constitutional convention, where would the final report and recommendations go in terms of feeding it back into the formal democratic process? I'm struggling still to work out exactly how you, what this constitutional convention does. I mean, who would be the, the, the people attending it, for example? So, well, building on the Citizens' Assembly pilots, um, what you would be doing would be getting a, a representative sample of the population in the different areas. Now, I think there's a, quite a strong case, and this is what we try to do with the pilots, of giving English citizens a say, given that Scottish citizens have had a lot of say over the future of their democracy. English citizens haven't been had that opportunity. If you were to do a series, for example, of regional conventions to get the constitutional conversation going, then you would be drawing a, a reasonably representative random sample of citizens from among those regions. I would strongly advocate um, for it to be a, a two-third citizens and a one-third politicians. They could be a mixture of local elected and national elected politicians, because I think there's real value in people and politicians coming together to resolve some of these issues. So that would be my, my direct answer to who the people would be. Other people who'd be vital to be involved would be experts and advocates who would come along and have a role as evidence given, givers and witnesses to the, the, the meetings. I mean, I, I was a member of Parliament for quite a long time and spent, as others here, a great deal of time, not only in one's own constituency and all the organisations you deal with, but having these sort of discussions, but also more broadly and more widely. What I'm struggling with is to see how this, this approach and the people you're involving in very, very complex issues. The moment, the, the moment you get into issues of um, different levels of, of um, assemblies and so on in different regions, and the extremely difficult questions of finance and mm -hmm. how you allocate them all out, and all of those very, very complex questions, which many of us struggle with for a very long time, very intensively, I'm struggling still to see what contribution this could make to the general thinking. But what was so encouraging was even in this mini pilot where people had two intensive weekends and three weeks between, um, I think you would have been really struck, as, as Matthew and I were, by the 
sheer ability to grapple with those complexities once people are given that opportunity to have knowledge shared with them and to develop their own knowledge. And Alan Rennick and others have examined this when you've looked at other similar exercises in other countries. There is absolutely an ability to deal with complexity in the citizenry. It is a chance of giving them the tools, resources and the time to do it. Taylor. I'll be restrained. Um, uh, how does this fit into the whole principle of representative democracy? Mm. Well, I think it, I think it's, it fits in. I mean, I, I hate to say such a phrase amongst such esteemed company, but there's a, a massive debate about post-democracy and what is happening. Most people's lives and politics, they're involved in politics. They might not admit it or understand it, but their everyday politics is a million miles away from the formal political processes or the institutions that, that, that we're, we're like in today. This is an adjunct. It is a, an evolution of democracy. It's a new way for responding to society's needs to play a greater role in deciding how they live their lives and where power lies. So that is the great challenge that, in a way, what you have with the rise of new parties is that you have bubbles of democratic energy and large sections of the community that are extremely critical. They're not anti-political, but they're pro a different form of politics. The big question for representative politics is whether it has the nimbleness or, and the agility to respond to broader social demands in a way that can tap into... It's almost like a pressure pot. Tap into and channel those democratic energies that are out there and exploding at the moment. A constitutional convention would provide one of a number of different ways that you could respond to some of that public angst and frustration that nobody listens to them and nobody's interested in them. And I think one of the issues around the current debate around devolution, decentralisation in England is there seems to be a view amongst sections of the public that this really is um, a very paternalistic, top-down view, that politicians and an elite at the local and central level know what's in the best interest for the public. The problem is that if the public were asked directly, they would probably reject what was on offer. So I think that is the, the issue. It is about blending and evolving representative democracy with new challenges of new new opportunities for engagement i think a lot of mps are already experimenting with different ways of doing politics and they're bringing yeah and they're, they're bringing uh, citizens citizens into the difficult trade-offs that elected representatives have to make and one of the values of this kind of process is that it actually forces citizens to confront directly the very difficult decisions and trade-offs that elected representatives are trying to make. So in that sense, I think deliberative or participative means are a kind of good complement and a possible strengthening of the representative democracy that we have. Lord Lester and then Lord Hunt. I can understand the case. I even agree with the case for a constitutional convention when it is considering concrete, focused proposals for example, with the Scottish Convention before the Scotland Act, for example, the Northern Irish Constitutional Convention uh, presided over by the then Lord, Lord Chief Justice. Um, that I can understand, but it seems to me that you're in danger of putting the, the cart before the horse if you have a constitutional convention without any clearly defined options and without some kind of body to help to steer the conversation. Otherwise, you finish up with a kind of constitutional babel, it seems to me. I'm sorry to mix my metaphors. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I agree with you, which is why uh, one of the things we tested out in the Assembly pilots was something very concrete in each area, which was a proposed devolution deal that had been set out in specific terms by local authorities in the area. So quite a lot of the discussion was saying to the citizens, what is it that you think about this? Have you got other ideas about it? So I'd, I'd absolutely kind of um, in, endorse that um, approach. I think it's got to be a bit of a mixture of getting some agenda setting and a bit of a, a freedom with um, an, a number of kind of options that would be put for, for put before the body with kind of good expertise. So I, I think I'd probably ag agree with you in, in, in those is important issues around design, agenda and focus. 
These assemblies, were they run before or after the general election? After. after. Hmm. Oh, see. So what was wrong with the general election in producing a deliberative and participatory democracy? Well, the electoral system, I would argue, gave us an electoral map that didn't fully reflect the views and the votes that were expressed across those nations. I mean, when you look at Scotland, which is probably a very stark example, you've got um, Labour, the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives, um, you know, sort of barely 5% of the seats or nearly half, half of the votes, where you've got the SNP 56 seats out of the 59 or 50% of the votes. So that would be... If you're looking at the future of the Union and future relations between the nations of the UK, I think you've really got to just have a look at how the electoral system is, in a multi-party era, no longer able to fully reflect the true diversity of views that are there. And I think actually gives you an electoral map which, which exaggerates political divides among the nations. Oh, um, I think I'm asking uh, also about this policy of decentralisation to cities and regions, um, we're told it's been lacking in public in engagement. Mm -hmm. And First of all, do you agree? And if so, what are the problems with this and how should it be rectified? Well, I think the, uh, the, the current process with the Devo deals and the Metro mayors um, has been lacking in public engagement, and that isn't just a criticism that, that, that we would make that's come out of a number of other different uh, committees and organisations. I suppose, looking forward, what was very interesting about the pilots was that the, both assemblies were generally in favour of the government's plans for devolution within England. However, they were not in favour of the specific model that was currently on offer and were in favour of a slightly different change. So the, the value of the assemblies is much is related very much to the knowledge that local communities can bring to specific areas. Um, but the current plans going forward, the, 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 the demands on local authorities that are in the areas that have put in for Devo deals um, are very, very weak in terms of the commitment for any form of public engagement. The risk is that we go forward to 2017 when we have the first elections of the mayors and the democratic turnout is so low that it brings the whole question of the authority of mayors into question. Uh, that is where, in a sense, the risk with the current model is that unless it is embedded and socially um, discussed and supported it will just seem like another top-down initiative that the public don't understand why it matters to them in their lives. Uh, I'm not, I never was a politician. I have great confidence in the jury system, and that's 12 citizens assembled together to, to make some very difficult decisions, examining sometimes very complex evidence. So I'm not surprised that a group of citizens sitting together who've taken sufficient interest to come along to what you describe as a national assembly... Uh, were intelligent, thoughtful, committed, and so on. There's nothing surprising about that. What I want to know is, if you introduce such a system, A, who's going to choose them, and then B, to whom are they responsible? And then C, aren't they going to be yet another body telling all the other citizens what they should and shouldn't be doing? <laughs> I mean, I'm not myself advocating a, at the moment, although it's an exciting idea, a kind of standing system of constitutional conventions. I'm advocating for now a kind of one-off that could really grapple with the very pressing issues. The questions are still the same questions, aren't they? Who selects yeah, them? Absolutely. And, so on. and one of the issues is whether this is a government-instituted process, hopefully with cross-party support, or whether it's not a government-instituted process. We were doing something that was kind of off our own bat, if you like, with a broad network, and that was important, important lessons because although there wasn't, um, it wasn't a government project and we couldn't promise the citizens that note would be taken of it, actually, nonetheless, they came along and showed appetite and, and, and willingness to engage. So I just think that's kind of one important point. So in direct answer to your question, who who chooses um, the citizens, it's going to slightly depend 
on who are the instigators of the project. And we would love to see a government instituted constitutional convention. If that doesn't happen, there are some good lessons from other conventions that have happened in the past. Um, and I think I've found it invaluable to be bringing together academics and campaigners and others so that you have a good group of, of, of people to come up with a, a sort of sensible and neutral design. And, sorry, Professor, you were to answer. I'm so well, sorry. I, I mean, I, I would I imagine that whether it was a government commissioned or a parliamentary commissioned inquiry, a chair would be selected of high public standard, standing, and then a random, an initially random selection process would fall in, in a sense. You know, many public citizens' juries have, have been used extensively in recent years as part of the, the move towards deeper forms of democracy, particularly at the local level. Um, you might have 100, 150 members of the public, cross-section, drawn from different regions of the UK with a very specific criteria. I would imagine it's more than likely that their recommendations would be advisory, and this would not mark a new start in terms of all issues going towards a constitutional convention, nor should it be a standing convention. But I think we are at a particular point in terms of the Constitution that there are so many untidy, loose ends. There is such a debate about the direction of travel and where we're going and why that actually now is a good time to have a constitutional convention that would be different to some of the more traditional ways that these issues might be looked at in order to provide a fresh way of thinking about politics. And what's interesting is often not only the people on the Assembly that learn a lot, but actually the politicians that are engaging with the Assembly learn a lot about the issues they're looking at too. Citizens' assemblies, or it's the pilots, hmm. not in terms of a process, but uh, do they yield any conclusion about what powers citizens want to see devolved or decentralised to their cities, regions, or communities, or is it at this stage too early to say? The, the, the detailed data analysis is going on, but the headline findings of the uh, Assemblies, particularly the Assembly in the North, was that the public were in favour of regional devolution within Eng England, but they preferred an Assembly model rather than a mayoral model, but they wanted the Assembly itself to have more powers than they had been previously offered in other similar uh, cases, particularly Lord Prescott's reforms a few years ago. So it was pro-regional government, but a more powerful model, not a city, large city mayor model. Lord Norton. Um, on decentralisation that's actually taking place now within England, um, what's happening seems to align with much of our evidence that it's asymmetrical and there's, there seems to be uh, support for that. So it's trying to meet local needs, moving as quickly as some areas can... Uh, sustain change, others can't. Um, what's your view on that? There is some conflicting evidence about whether that's actually sustainable or not, because the danger is certain areas may be left behind. Mm -hmm. um, is it sustainable? What do you see as the merits and demerits of what's actually happening? Should this process, should we maintain this asymmetrical uh, decentralisation? I, I don't think there's any problem with asymmetrical devolution in principle, yeah. I think the concern at the moment is around the speed of the process and the underpinning values and principles that are guiding that process. It's all very well to say, let a thousand flowers bloom. However, there is an issue about the obvious fragmentation that is likely to occur if that goes forward too quickly. So... And I think this is maybe one of the issues around the Constitutional Convention, is that it does often allow for some space for thinking and talking, actually for listening, which can be incredibly healthy. I also think one of the issues at the moment with the, the asymmetry is not just about geography, it's about the balance in terms of the focus of the policy, that the policy at the moment is about driving the economy and economic growth. That's important, that's incredibly valuable, but it has to be op offset with a focus on social aspects of people's lives. 
and, and that is where I think there is a slight imbalance at the moment. So absolutely no problem with asymmetrical devolution, but where is the blueprint, where is the glue that holds the system together? That is the big question for me. And I think that's the, the, the great thing about the Constitutional Convention, that it can really help allow the public supported to think through those issues, because what we have at the moment is a whole range of centrifugal forces pulling the UK in different directions. And again, that's not itself a problem, but where is the glue that is holding us together as a union? Where are the pragmatic international best practices for stopping and letting us think about the nature of the democracy we want? And that's what we don't have the reflective space, as it were, at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with what um, Tress Flinders has, has said, that, that we have an asymmetry of powers, not necessarily a, a problem, mm. uh, asymmetry of population, which is a, a fact to be grappled with, and I think the real problem with the local picture and the march of devolution at the moment is, is the asymmetry of, of public voice. It is completely arbitrary as to whether any local resident of any corner of the country is going to have any say over the, the, the flavour and, and the settlement of devolution in their area. And I think this is where we can relate the local to the, the national very clearly. If, if we don't start with the kind of values and the principles and the criteria that, that should underpin the, the kind of political structures, then I think we're left kind of flailing around. And I think that's what we're seeing at, at the national level and we're also seeing it at the local level. And I think then you have real problems in terms of a lack of public support, legis legitimacy, sustainability and stability. But don't you have a problem even if you create the framework where there can be a greater discourse, people can discuss, you might not still reach agreement. And there's still a problem that you might find there is a commonality view in one area, but next door there's a different... Uh, yeah. view and therefore you might have to go your separate ways or not actually have any agreement at all about what should be decentralised so you're then falling behind relative to those where you, areas where you have reached agreement. Yeah I guess the problem at the moment is that there are sort of multiple speeds and one of the consequences of that is quite literally that in some areas people won't even feel they've had a chance to even think about where they want power to lie in, in their area. Yeah, there's a very, a very strong sort of me too dynamic going on, that if, if these councils are getting in on the action, then we must do so really quickly too. And um, whilst I can under, understand the logic and the faces, that the, 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 the real challenges that local authorities are facing, which are incredibly tough, um, it's actually very interesting. Michael Heseltine gave a speech where he actually said that the English devolution deal shouldn't be spoken about in terms of devolution or decentralisation, it was the Westminster model, it was just a new partnership where the central state would tell local authorities what to do with even more direction and the, by the trade-off was slightly more flexibility in delivering those goals. The big risk for local authorities is that they will become the public face of austerity and, and, and local authorities are, are well aware of these challenges. But and this is something, you know, we have to retain a sense of optimism and positivity that as a, a collection of people, a community nationally, locally and regionally, we can address these challenges. And I, I you know, I said this, and maybe I shouldn't have said it in front of the Assembly, but I said I'd been a professor for, of politics for 20 years. And I'd, I'd learned more about politics by running these assemblies than I had from reading thousands of books about real politics and how it affects people's lives. And I just think that is really an important reflection in terms of where we go from here, given the challenges that face us economically and democratically. And this issue about what binds us, because that really is the, the central issue, that what, where's the centripetal force that can allow for flexibility, difference? We have new academic centres for super diversity, what still gives us a commonality and goal that allows us to live together? And I think that is where a constitutional convention, properly resourced, over time, done transparently, it will not deliver all the answers. Not everybody will agree on all the recommendations, 
but it will help put down certain markers that then the politicians who have quite rightly been elected to make decisions will have a better basis on which to make those decisions. Well, we've come to the end of the allotted time. Thank you both very much indeed for the insights you've given us from your own experience and uh, knowledge of the working of these assemblies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.